What's up, everybody? Today, we're going to examine the most ridiculously powerful, utterly broken singles Pokemon that were without question the most defining feature and unanimously considered the best of their respective metagames. These Pokemon warped their tears around them with their obscene power and were so ridiculously good that it didn't matter if you knew they were coming. They just could not be stopped. Their strength was such that players who didn't use them on your team were at a disadvantage against players who did. So join us in counting down the most broken Pokemon of all time. Starting off our list at number 5 is Tyranitar in the third generation of OU. Tyranitar is an impressive Pokemon in his own right, with its monstrous base stat total denoting it the status of pseudo-legendary. Its base stat total is so high it's equal to or greater than half the advanced Uber's metagame. While its speed isn't that impressive, it can easily fix it with Dragon Dance, which also boosts its already massive attack stat. This set is considered the single most dangerous sweeper in the metagame, and any team that can't handle it isn't viable. This brings us to a Another one of Tyranitar's strengths, its move pull. It can viably run a plethora of different sets, making it immensely difficult to handle safely. It has no true counters and can bypass every attempt commonly used to thwart it without much effort. For example, Flygon is incredibly sturdy against Dragon Dash Tyranitar until Tyranitar pulls out Ice Beam. Milotic is great against mixed Tyranitar, but gets smashed by Choice Band. Dugtrio is usually a pretty safe revenge killer, but not when Tyranitar sets up a substitute. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what Tyranitar can do, and thanks to its great bulk and useful resistances, Tyranitar gets plenty of opportunity to come in and wreak havoc. It's also terrific in a supporting role, with its ability to safely pursue Trap Gengar, being a crucial cornerstone of many of the metagame's key strategies. However, Tyranitar isn't perfect. It sings in the shower. Sometimes it'll spend too much time volunteering. Occasionally, it'll hit someone with its car. But most importantly, Tyranitar is slow and its weaknesses to the common water ground and fighting moves aren't difficult to exploit. Plus, even Tyranitar can only run on four moves, and thus its mighty offenses can fall flat in certain matchups against the right defensive core. So what is it that makes Tyranitar so obscenely good that it is unanimously considered the greatest Pokemon in advance and so influential that it appears on this list? Simple. Its ability, Sandstream, which significantly affects quite literally every single battle it's in and shapes the entire metagame. If a sand effective Pokemon doesn't hold leftovers, it's on a timer. 6% may not seemed like a lot at first, but it adds up quickly, and a Pokemon like Heracross can suddenly be in KO range from weaker attacks. If a sand affected Pokemon does hold leftovers, it doesn't heal. It just stays at a certain health and misses out on the benefits of other items, notably the status clearing Lumberry. The neutering of leftovers severely affects the walling ability of several of the metagame's top Pokemon. Suicune and Snorlax are incredibly difficult to KO with their leftovers unrestricted, but in sand they find themselves overwhelmed by repeated attacks quite quickly. Even hits that don't do that much damage in and of themselves. The best example is Snorlax completely walling Zapdos out of sand and struggling to switch in safely more than once in sand. Sand also makes advances passive damage a lot more fast acting. Spikes aren't a huge deal outside of sand, but in conjunction with sand, they pressure the opponent incredibly hard, as do Toxic and Leech Seed. Sand immune Pokemon such as Metagross itself are at a huge advantage. They're able to heal with leftovers and they're free to run non-leftover items without being put on a timer. The metagame's damage calculations have to take Sandstorm into account. For example, Zapdos might be able to survive two Choice Band Meteor Mashes from Metagross with Leftovers Recovery, but if the two mashes add up to a minimum of 94%, it will be taken out by Sand. In short, everything about the metagame revolves around Sand, dealing with it, abusing it, on rare occasions even clearing it with Weather Moves. This in conjunction with Tyranitar's monstrous offensive threat level and incredibly useful defensive utility is what makes it the best Pokemon in advance and the fifth most broken Pokemon Pokemon of all time. Next up at number 4 is Tauros in the first generation of OU. The first ever OU metagame revolved around a small group of elite Pokemon, mostly normals and psychics, and the normal type Tauros was the top dog, or 
top bull, if you will. It was one of the fastest Pokemon around, and in Generation 1, this was deadly because of Pokemon's base speed stat correlated to its critical hit rate. For example, Snorlax's meager 30 base speed meant it had a critical hit rate of just under 6%. In Tauros's case, its impressive 110 base speed gave it a critical hit rate of almost 21.5%. This was inherently useful because being faster than nearly all opposing Pokemon meant Tauros could devastate them with crits before they could even move. What made it even more threatening was its normal typing, which gave it stab on some very dangerous moves. The first was Body Slam, almost always Tauros's opening move because it was riskless and incredibly difficult to switch into. Given that there were almost no resists, and the few Pokemon that did resist normal were completely incapable of safely handling Tauros, the Rock types, Rhydon and Golem, were easily two hit KO'd by Blizzard and one hit KO'd with a crit. And the noticeably rare Gengar met the same fate against Earthquake. Body Slam was also a terrific weapon because it had a nasty 30% chance of inflicting paralysis. This meant the few faster Pokemon couldn't switch in safely, namely Starmie. Slower Pokemon like Cloyster having to deal with potential full paralysis also made their ability to deal with Tauros even more of a roll of the dice. Tauros's second dangerous stab move was its finisher, Red, Blue, and Yellow's most infamous attack, Hyper Beam, which in the first generation didn't cause a recharge turn if it KO'd an opposing Pokemon. It was already a dangerous move given Tauros's solid attack stat, but with its high crit rate, it was another beast altogether, and since Tauros was faster than nearly the entire metagame, it could potentially mow down entire teams. These two stab moves made it so difficult to switch into safely. A Pokemon couldn't just withstand Tauros's Body Slam, it had to withstand the combination of Body Slam and Hyper Beam. With crits and paralysis involved, Tauros made games exceptionally messy and was without a doubt a player's best weapon. It was so difficult to deal with that many games came down to the most well-known 50-50 in Pokemon history, the Tauros War. Any RBY player knows the sequence to get the opposing Tauros into range of their own. Slam, slam, beam. Now, critical hits complicated it, of course, and there was an element of prediction if those happen. For example, if Tauros crit the first slam, there would be a prediction battle to see if the players whose Tauros was crit would switch out to a healthy Pokemon as the opposing Tauros hyper beam, forcing a recharge turn. As if all that wasn't enough, Eevees being maxed in RBY meant Tauros was quite bulky itself and was no glass cannon. Rhydon's beefy earthquake from base 130 attack didn't come close to two hit KOing, and Tauros even survived Snorlax's immensely powerful powerful, defense having stab, self-destruct around 85% of the time. Tauros was the leading member of RBY's big four, the Pokemon considered a cut above the rest that should have a place on nearly every if not every team. The others were Snorlax, Chansey, and Exeggutor. However, one could feasibly make an effective team without one of those other three. The same was absolutely not true for Tauros, it absolutely had to be on your team. Part of its mandatory status stemmed from the fact that it had zero drawback, as not using it would be a a pointless, enormous disadvantage. Tauros was the epitome of everything RBY, and as a king of the critical hits, it's the fourth most broken Pokemon of all time. At number 3 is Snorlax in the second generation of OU. GSC Snorlax is by far the strongest Pokemon ever allowed in OU without being banned. It is basically impossible to overpower with offense, and despite its lack of resistances, its beefy special defense alongside its monstrous HP let it shrug off even monstrous special attacks like Zapdos' Thunder, and its meager defense stat is more than made up for by Curse alongside that well-known huge HP. Lax's only weakness was the fighting type moves, and those need stab to hurt it after a curse. Even something like Tyranitar's Dynamic Punch is pretty non-threatening once Snorlax has gotten a boost. The only Pokemon that uses stab fighting in OU, Machamp, is not at all a reliable switch to Lax's attacks. The most reliable way to deal with Snorlax was to stall it. And given Snorlax's incredible power and diverse offensive move pool, that not only required multiple checks, but it wasn't even guaranteed to work. Growl, Miltank, Charm, Umbreon, and the combination of a Skarmory with a Rock or Ghost type handled the standard Sleep Talk, Earthquake, and Fire Blast variants of Cursed Snorlax, but Belly Drum and All Out Attacking Mix variants could smash right through those. Cursed Snorlax could even run Belly Drum on the same set. Snorlax even had access to a sleep move, Lovely Kiss, making it absolutely ludicrous to safely counter as well as a pretty decent check to most variants of opposing Lax. Self Destruct and Sleep Talk, the latter alongside Curse, are also generally great offensive and defensive options, respectively, and among their main selling points were their ability to handle opposing Snorlax. It could mix and match its 
moves to run any set it wanted to, and all of them would work. It had a nearly endless array of great sets. Lovely Kiss mixed with Self Destruct? Sure. Three attacks with Rest? You bet. Curse Rest with two normal stabs, mixing Body Slams Paralysis with Double Edge's sheer power? Why not? It could even effectively incorporate rarer options like Thunder and Surf. One didn't simply counter Snorlax, they had to play around it. Offensive teams had to be very aggressive, packing multiple explosions to try and keep it in check. They were willing to sacrifice entire Pokemon to take Snorlax out, or even to just bring it low on HP. Even defensive teams, which preferred to play safely, had to be aggressive. They couldn't let Snorlax do whatever it wanted, because it would force them into back foot positions and break them in the long run. Snorlax was also a huge boon for defensive teams though. Not only did it provide excellent utility against dangerous Pokemon like Needle King, it was a one Pokemon army offensively, meaning that its bulky teammates didn't have to worry about not being able to break opposing teams. Belly Drum Snorlax could break anything, and indeed massive classic GSC stall teams consisted of five defensive Pokemon and Drumlax, with Lax still being excellent just by virtue of its typing, bulk, and rest. GSC Snorlax had the incredibly rare combination of being the metagame's best Pokemon on offense and defense, and since every team had to have it, every team was by default decently defensively equipped against top threats while having the tools to threaten any opposing defensive core. It was so overwhelming that there was often no choice but to go for a Snorlax war. Snorlax was even better than just about every single gold, silver, and crystal uber. There was no doubt about Ho-Oh and Celebi, and there was a strong case for Lugia, Mew, and even Mewtwo as well. And for its unparalleled offensive and defensive prowess that shaped and defined every single aspect of GSCOU and was nigh impossible to stop safely, Snorlax comes in as the third most broken Pokemon of all time. Number two on this list is Mega Rayquaza in the sixth generation of Ubers. Rayquaza was already one of the most threatening Uber Pokemon around, so when it got a Mega Form, people rightfully freaked out. The boosts it got were nothing short of ludicrous. It's already sky high, pun intended. Attack and special attack stats were catapulted up to an astonishing base 180. This was equivalent to the mighty Deoxys attack. However, old DOA was balanced out by making wet tissue paper look durable in comparison to its base 20 defense and special defense. Mega Ray had no such issues, as its defense and special defense stats were raised as well, going up to 100, making it quite tanky alongside its excellent 105 HP. What made it even tankier was the same thing that truly pushed it over the edge. Its ability, Delta Stream, which summons strong winds. What these strong winds did is remove every drawback to being a flying type. This wasn't in the more abstract sense, like how using a certain Pokemon had no downside. This was in the sense that there was literally only upside to Rayquaza's flying typing because strong winds removed flying type's weaknesses while letting it keep the benefits, like its ground immunity and stab on its vicious new move, Dragon Ascent, a flying type clone of close combat. This was absolutely huge because it meant despite still being a dragon flying type, Mega Rayquaza only had a regular weakness to ice moves instead of its usual quadruple weakness. In conjunction with its terrific bulk, even something as ridiculously powerful as Primal Kyogre's Ice Beam wouldn't come close to KOing it. Mega Rayquaza also had its rock weakness neutered, meaning it was no longer held back by the ever pesky Stealth Rock, even with Life Orb recoil factored in. Wait, Life Orb? Megas can't hold items? Well, yes, that's correct. But the producers over at Everybody Loves Mega Rayquaza decided that it just wasn't obscene enough, so they decided to make a Mega that could in fact hold items. For the short time it was in the tier, Mega Ray completely warped everything around it. Not only was it absolutely required on every team, it also made all other Megas completely obsolete, which was no mean feat given those Megas included Gengar and Salamence. Wait, again, for the short time it was in the tier? This is Ubers. Where could it possibly go? Well, the Ubers player base unanimously felt that the complete lack of options to deal with Mega Rayquaza made the tier unplayable, and that was saying something about how extreme of a case it was, considering that playing around broken threats is the definition of Ubers. Thus, less than a month after it came into existence, Mega Rayquaza managed to achieve what was previously impossible and was banned from Ubers. It had a new tier created just for it, anything goes. And for this feat alone, it is the second most broken Pokemon of all time.
And before we move on to the most broken Pokemon of all time, we have two honorable mentions as far as broken aspects of Pokemon. They aren't Pokemon themselves, but have had similarly powerful impacts on the metagames they have been in. The first honorable mention is the rain in 5th generation of OU. Politoed and friends were so strong that they spent the entire generation getting nerfed. First, Swift Swim was banned from being used alongside Drizzle, which already was a blow to several Pokemon like Kingdra, Kabutats, and Ludicolo, to name a few. However, that didn't stop rain at all. It was incredible not just on offense but on defense as rainstall fueled by the incredible rain dish tentacruel became dominant it was so good that all throughout the generations players wanted it nerfed even further thunderous was banned tornadus therian was banned Keldeo came close to being banned twice or even banned outright as they believed rain's inherent power such as making starmie impossible to switch into or neutering ferrothorn's biggest weakness was too much to handle though rain as a whole never was banned there was no denying that it was the absolute face of gen 5 ou and much controversy stemmed from its power. The second honorable mention is Stealth Rock in every generation starting with Generation 4. Universally considered the best move in the game ever since its introduction, it is a staple on just about every competitive team, no matter the metagame. One turn setup, accessible by a variety of great Pokemon, permanent unless manually removed, damages literally every Pokemon without the Magic Guard ability, at least a little bit just for switching in, some for up to 25 or even 50% HP, wink wink nudge nudge, the epitome of low risk high reward stealth rock shapes the metagame key damage calculations have to keep it in mind in just about every single battle it's in to some degree unless it's removed from the game in future generations there's no sign that stealth rock will ever stop defining each and every single's metagame And finally, the number one Pokemon on our list is Zacian in the 8th generation of Ubers. Well, first Zacian Crown, and then just Zacian. Zacian was already a terrifying physical attacker. It had an excellent base 130 attack stat and the move pool to go with it. Stab Play Rough was accentuated by close combat, crunch, and wild charge. Oh, and it also had an incredible base 138 speed stat, letting it get the jump on just about everything. Oh, and it also had the ability Intrepid Sword, which gave it a plus one attack boost just for switching in. This would make it an incredibly strong, potent choice Garfer. Easily the best no setup needed cleanup artist in the game. Alternatively, it could run Choice Band, whose boost would interact with plus one attack to raise it to stupefying levels. It wasn't like Zashi was getting a plus two attack boost. It was getting a Choice Band boost on its attack set after it had been boosted, which is a lot higher. It was like a download Genesect that would always boost attack, no matter what it switched in against. Utterly terrifying. However, it doesn't even and there, Zacian had another item it could hold, Rusted Sword, which could transform it into Zacian Crown, a Pokemon seemingly designed to break the game. It had the speed boost to an eye-popping base 148, it had its attack jacked up to a monstrous base 170, it gained partial steel typing, and an even stronger new stab move in Behemoth Blade. Oh yeah, both Zacians had base 115 defenses alongside 92 HP, and superb defensive typing, so they were great at tanking hits too. At least if they were glad cannons that have been something but nope Zacian crown trucked pretty much everything and it outran pretty much everything without a scarf thanks to its amazing bulk and longevity since its steel typing also made it stealth rock resistant as if it didn't already have a million things going for it most scarfers would struggle to ko it too checking Zacian crown was nearly impossible yeah there were pokemon that were ko'd a little less easily than the entire rest of the game like quagsire and tangrowth and the krasma dust main but they were still eternally vulnerable to Zacian crown crown's mind-boggling power and coverage. It also had Swords Dance, of course, just in case you thought you could take a hit from it. Many times, a player would have no better option to deal with Zacian Crown than their own Zacian Crown. Can you say RBY Tauros? Eventually, the player base decided to send Zacian Crown the way of Mega Rayquaza, and thus it went to anything goes. Thankfully, base Zacian was way less broken. Oh, never mind. Turns out, base Zacian was also obscenely broken, for pretty much the same reasons as its crown form. And who would have thought, given it's completely fair and balanced offensive traits and this is why zashian is our number one most broken pokemon of all time as it was banned to anything goes in two forms and that concludes this video and we hope you have enjoyed psych
both Zacian forms are fearsome, but even combined, they are no match for the original Uber, the Pokemon that created the very idea of the Uber tier. Mewtwo was the first Pokemon that was so clearly overpowered that it necessitated separation from its peers for the sake of balanced matches. Mew eventually joined it in Ubers, but it didn't have the same overt, blatant level of dominance over other Pokemon that Mewtwo did. Gen 1 Mewtwo cannot be described with anything other than superlatives, and even those fail to capture the sheer scope of its power and impact. It's the epitome of why psychic types are dominant in Gen 1, taking every aspect of other strong psychics and dialing each up to 11. It was an incredible critical hit rate over 25% by virtue of its base 130 speed, which makes it effectively the fastest Pokemon in the game. Now it's outsped by Electrode and ties with Jolteon and Aerodactyl, but all three Pokemon are meager in Ubers. Its base 154 special stat is simply staggering. For comparison, OU's strongest special stat comes from Alakazam, who is considered quite powerful, and clocks in at base 135. What makes Mewtwo even more terrifying is Amnesia, which, given how the special stat encompasses both special attack and special defense in RBY, is the equivalent of two calm minds in one turn. The entirety of RBY Ubers revolves around trying to get the upper hand with one's own Mewtwo without losing to the opponent's Mewtwo. Given that the only type that resists psychic moves is psychic itself, and the only Pokemon that can match Mewtwo's special attack and special attack boost from Amnesia with equivalent special defense and special defense boost is also Mewtwo and Amnesia, as well as the fact that pretty much every other Pokemon to exist loses hard to Mewtwo. Then it makes sense that just about every single battle will have at least some Mewtwo on Mewtwo action. Nothing else is safe. Not only is there nothing Mewtwo can't brute force its way through with boost, it also has impeccable coverage. Any Slowbro trying to get into an Amnesia War with it can be quickly dispatched with Thunderbolt, while Exeggutor gets trashed by Blizzard. Even Light Screen Chansey is in danger if and when its special gets dropped by Mewtwo's fearsome psychic. Mewtwo is not an easy cat to wear down either. It has Recover, which boasts 32 PP in the first generation, and has a solid defense stat alongside a huge HP stat. Even Storlax's stab defense having self-destruct doesn't come close to KOing it. It tops out at 92%. That is, unless Mewtwo decides to run Barrier. You do not handle Mewtwo. You simply pray that you come out on top with your own Mewtwo. And alternative options include status with either Paralysis or Freeze combined with Prayer. Not exactly reliable stuff. Mega Rayquaza and both Zacians may have gotten banned from Ubers, but Mewtwo created Ubers and proceeded to dominate it as it abused every single broken mechanic the first Pokemon games had to offer. From the speed crit chances, the singular special stat, the lack of types unable to stand up to the psychic typing, Mewtwo did it all. And Gen 1 Mewtwo is the single most broken Pokemon of all time. And so there we are with the most broken singles Pokemon ever. There is no disputing their power or handling it for that matter. One can only hope to wield it themselves. But we want to know, do you agree and why or why not? We'd also like to know what other kinds of lists you would want to see as we're trying to expand our content. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.